then due to some technical difficulties, unfortunately, Inthu will not be able to join us, but she has been working on this presentation with us and is a part of our Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation Coalition. She is from Sri Lanka and she's the director of that chapter there. Next, we also have Radha Baudel, who is based in Nepal and is our menstrual activist, pioneer, and the founder and director for the Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation founding chapter in Nepal. All right. So today we're gonna to be starting off with an outline of our presentation today. It's gonna to be a mixture of lecture style along with some videos and a question and answer for everybody in the end to really just tell us about your questions, concerns, and um, any questions that you may have. So first we're gonna start off with a video show on dignified menstruation. Then we'll have an introduction to Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation. Dignified Menstruation experience from Sri Lanka, which will be considered a part of the Global South. Then we'll talk about how does dignified menstruation show up in the globe in the global north so specifically in north america then we'll be speaking about menstrual discrimination across religion and geography the impact of menstrual discrimination urgency of dignified menstruation dignified menstruation day and the international conference and the declaration on dignified menstruation then we'll be ending with some questions and answers so first, let's go ahead and take a look at our video. Tin <laughs> We have to speak about the dignity. Each girl deserves dignity during the menstruation. That means she can do everything no matter whether she has a period or not. Because of the restriction during the five days, you have a feeling of demonization throughout the month, throughout the life. And powerless were working on the like the holistic approach, my address got no potsaina. Bad mother bandera, Tabat, imposed Garera, the words of the good Hurubatkaira, Tagali Garera, Patrika Manikalera, Matrimonaki, Minavarice, Baniko, Ostarago to Kurirago to Banajan, Bramcha, to Bramma Nikala Porta, dignified ministers and dignified ministers and Banera Ponisaki Pachi, Surumanji Risunchan, and we started convincing Sunchan, we started practice and test for Nathalsan, and within five, six months, and they start to understand and they. Thank you so much again to our team for a wonderful short little video just kind of explaining about the basis of a dignified menstruation. And so let's go back into our presentation. And you can find that at our website, dignifiedmenstruation.org. You can also find that at our Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation um, YouTube channel as well. All right. So you may be wondering, what is this Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation? 
We are a international coalition based and founded in Nepal. So it's really this movement and this menstrual movement was been, which has been building for a very, very long time. But officially this coalition was established in 2019. And like I said, it first was founded in Nepal and it's led by survivors, survivors of menstrual violence, survivors of menstrual discrimination, and survivors as menstruators in a world that violates our very biological and common and you know natural phenomenon. And so here, this has led as a movement that is asking to prioritize our dignity, to prioritize menstruators in this menstrual movement. So this movement is different in that it's cultivating a global understanding of the lack of dignity during menstruation and all throughout a menstruator's life and what that means and what impacts it has on that menstruator's daily life, on their political value, their social value, their economical value, and of the risks and dangers that they face living in this world of sexual violence, gender-based violence, mental discrimination, and how all those those identities come and intersect. So we are prioritizing and fighting for dignity with menstruation. And that means the ability to live one's life dignified and not feel the shame, taboo, stigma, and restrictions and discriminations that menstruators face every single day. On top of it, like we said before, this is founded in Nepal. And so Nepal is a survivor country. We, you know, internationally, we I'm sure we've seen in the media that, you know, there's been a highlight of menstrual huts and topadi and this, you know, this act of this traditional practice. And, you know, as always, because the menstrual movement has started in the global north and is primarily led by the global north, the the conversation around it is always going to be around health and hygiene, whereas we are moving towards dignity and prioritizing menstruators. And so Nepal is a survivor country. It is where we have started this project, it is where Radha has founded this. And, you know, her story is one of survival from a very, very young age. She had, you know, left her home at a very young age in attempt of suicide, of leaving this world because she didn't feel that the atrocities that were being asked of her, the social stigma and, and taboo around menstruation were, you know, a violation of her human right. And so it's a story born out of pain and survival. And it's a story that prides in dignity and one that looks for community and organization and is founded in a grassroots organization. And now we are in 10 to 11 different more countries. We have chapters that are really you know, collaborating together to again, build that global understanding of menstrual discrimination and violence and how insidious this violence is and how deep it impacts each menstruator and non-menstruator as well as society at large. So, um, like I said, our establishment was formally in 20, since 2019, but we've been working in dignified menstruation um, through our, our founding other non, um, non-profit organization as well. And so our steering committee, we have um, folks from different countries. We have Anupa, Anna, Esther, myself, Pefi, Lakshman, and these are all folks from different parts of the world coming together to really plan out how our coalition is going to move forward globally. We have country coordinators in different countries, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Australia, and we are looking to expand more every single day. Our membership is free and it is available at dignifiedadministration.org membership. And here you can take a look at our simple form. And if you too are a champion of menstrual equity and advocate for dignity with menstruation and the idea that each menstruator should be able to live a dignified life free from any form of violence or discrimination against menstruation and this idea that menstruation is an impure, dirty and taboo subject, then please join us. You can also follow us on Instagram at underscore dignified underscore menstruation or on our Facebook pages for Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation. 
And so these are all our different chapters. And so all our chapters um, speak to our, our um, steering committee. And they also reside in, like I said, in every corner of the world, because we know that menstrual discrimination and violence exists in every corner of the world. And so to dismantle that system, we must work as a global community. And so now we're gonna go ahead and move forward into the Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation, Global South. And this is going to be an experience from Sri Lanka. And I'll have Radha go ahead and share her screen now. <laughs> Thank you, sorry for um, the interruption. My internet disconnected. Mm. <sighs> Um, due to um, health issue, our colleague uh, Intu from Sri Lanka cannot um, join right now. That is why I'm uh, presenting uh, on her behalf. Actually, in Sri Lanka, there is no talk about the um, uh, menstruation at all. There is a taboo, there is a stigma. Um, there is a um, huge stigma for untouchability during the menstruation. Um, neither women uh, like to touch by themselves uh, and nor other people um, like to touch to the menstruating women and they cannot participate in any kind of cultural or festivals or ritual activities. And the girls um, who are menstruating, they've experienced uh, various types of um, uh, discrimination and physical uh, violences in the schools, uh, particularly when they are joining in sports. And their education, quality education, retention of the schools also heavily impacted on um, impacted due to the menstrual discrimination. And they also equally um, uh, economically burden during the menstruation. Um, uh, the women cannot join in, in, in the garment factory or they have to go with uh, taking um, uh, birth control pills to in order to avoid the menstruation. During the menstruation, um, menstruating uh, menstruators cannot sit uh, anywhere as they wish, and they also uh, have to change their working hours, and um, they. Um, also have to take medicine. Some um, uh, use the herbal medicine, home medicine, and some use the birth control pills as I said uh, before. And um, they also um, not allow or, or not um, welcoming to participate official event uh, during the menstruation. And in order to that, um, in addition to that, the, uh, in the public spaces, there is no mineral friendly environment in terms of providing mineral product or um, discussion, counseling, or um, um, health care if they have any health related issues or um, separate toilet water supply um, and other essential um, infrastructure for menstruation. As a result, the menstruators are experiencing various kinds of um, sexual and gender-based violence at family, at the school and at our place and everywhere. These are the fueling factors or underlying cause for um, experiencing sexual and gender based violence. Um, they um, remain absent in school, some uh, dropouts, they fail in a class, and they also um, um, discontinue to go to the school. Um, they feel demonization, inferior, powerless in front of their colleagues. They continuously experience physical, sexual, political, economical violences, including deprivation from um, access to resources in their surroundings. This is the, um, the tiny story or experience from Sri Lanka. Thank you. 
Millie, now your turn again. Let perfect. me use the slides for you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Let me. All right, thank you so much. So now we'll be moving on to menstrual discrimination in the global north. So there's this idea perpetrated that menstrual discrimination only happens in places that there's not enough menstrual products or there is not enough, um, or there's not enough, you know, resources to maybe supply those kind of products. It's always about product and health and hygiene and access to healthcare. However, we know that menstrual discrimination and violence against menstruation exist in every corner of the globe. And so in North America, we see there's widespread discrimination against menstruation. And we see how that, um, that really violates menstruators in their daily life. So the types of, of discriminations that we see globally and in North America is gonna be first interpersonal violence. Interpersonal is gonna be the type of relationships that menstruators have with non-menstruators. How do non-menstruators view menstruation? How do they view menstruators? How does their view of menstruation as a dirty, shameful, or something that, you know, is not a public subject, how does that impact their understanding or their value of menstruators? So that would be our interpersonal discrimination. Then there's a structural and institutional discrimination. So examples of this that we can think about is the tampon tax. Why is there a tax on a luxury item? You can think about the lack of bodily illiteracy, bodily literacy and the lack of knowledge around menstrual health and hygiene and menstruations as a whole and in the institution. The lack of seeing menstruation as the fifth vital sign for our medical institution. So you see how all these different institutions are really impacted by menstrual discrimination and they serve to sustain and maintain that structure. And structurally, all the institutions talk to each other and therefore policies, you know, legislations, policies, the medicine, education will all work together to sustain that discrimination and silence and violence against menstruation and menstruators and that lack of dignity. On the far right here, you see that there's intrapersonal. So this is what is your relationship to your menses? How do you consider menstruation? Do you think that you are impure and dirty? How does how does society's value of menstruation as a shameful taboo topic contribute to your own, you know, or your own self-esteem, your own relationship to yourself, to menstruation. So you see that there's all these different kinds of violences and we'll move forward into learning a little bit more about them. So the impact of menstrual discrimination and the lack of dignity. Due to the lack of dialogue on menstruation and menstrual health, specifically in the global north, because we are considered to be, you know, a region that is free from this type of discrimination, because internationally the UN recognizes menstruation, menstrual discrimination as a harmful traditional practices, it is easy for in the global north to point all of our fingers to the global south and say that is where discrimination lies. They are the ones with the problem. When we know that you see the white savior mentality deep in the menstrual movement, so it focuses primarily on menstrual products, hygiene, health, and there are deep and insidious impacts of menstrual discrimination because it creates that culture of violence and silence against menstruators. So in the global north, we can't even really talk about discrimination because the the dialogue is not there because we have been told that we are not discriminated against. You have paths that you can buy. So again, this idea that capitalism has, has somehow erased discrimination, we know that it's not true. So what are the types of taboo, shame, and stigma? So you see here, um, you know, examples of how there's a lack of menstrual dignity in North America. And you can see it through these sort of three main branches. So we see that there is strong social stigma. We see that there is a financial and economic burden. We see in discrimination. And we also see that there's a lack of menstrual education and bodily literacy. So menstrual discrimination exists again due to the inherent misogynistic 
toxic sexist values perpetrated by patriarchy, which says that menstruation is a dirty, impure um, phenomenon. And we know that it's just a natural biological phenomenon. And it serves to create and uphold this social system, which labels menstruation and menstruators as inferior, as shameful, as tabooed, and impedes on menstruators inalienable human right for dignity. And that's what we must always consider when we're talking about menstrual discrimination and about dignified menstruation is that we have this inalienable human right for dignity that is currently being impeded upon. So how are different examples of how we see menstruation as a social stigma? So first, menstruation, you know, is a subject of taboo in society. It's not really a public topic. It's a more indoor private topic. And so, but you see that this has an impact on young menstruators and, and menstruators of all ages, but specifically as, um, as you know, young menstruators are growing up, you see that here in Canada, 63% have felt that they have had to hide about tampon or pads that are brought to the washroom at work or school, even though the work and school should be telling you that it is okay to menstruate because we know that that is a normal biological phenomenon and therefore there, sh there should be an ability to have that dialogue. 38.9% were late to school or left school early and inability to learn was impacted. And normally you would see that, you know, leaving school, not being able to go to school, you see a lot of this talk in the global south, but it also exists in the global north. And it's simply one due to that taboo of not being able to talk about menstruation or menstrual health or PMS or menstrual cramps. Here in Mexico, we, ha we have a um, statistic that says one in three menstruators skip school during menses due to stigma. If one in three people are skipping school, there's a lot of menstruators skipping school. That's a lot of, that really increases that gap between the, the, the two genders that we see, right? So here, the subject of taboo in society really restricts menstruators from speaking about menses in the public and in the private spaces. What does this do? This cuts down their agency, their empowerment, their ability to speak about their bodies and what is necessary and urgent for them. It strips away their dignity. And it results in the absence of menses as a public health and social justice issue. Why don't we see a big movement? We see the movement is still there and is growing, but why don't we see this as a violation of someone's human right? Another example we see is the use of euphemisms. Time of the month, period, female troubles, aunt flow, on the rag, regla. These are all just euphemisms for um, menstruation. And this really just further stigmatizes menstruation because it uses indirect words as if saying menses or menstruation is dirty, as if just saying that is a sin or a taboo, as if saying that makes you less than. And it also alienates menstruators who do not identify as a female or as a woman, because we know that not all girls bleed, but everyone who bleeds deserves dignity. On the third prong of this, we see that menstruation is really a very it's a phenomenon that is stigmatized as in multiple different ways. It's seen as an abomination of the body. seen as tribal identities or a social marker for associated with a marginalized group. So menstruation in all of it all is considered something that really makes you less than in society. And so it labels menstruators as less than non-menstruators. And it again serves to create and maintain that gender-based power structure that follows misogyny and patriarchal values. So the second prong that we see how it shows how deep menstrual violence and discrimination is, is going to be the lack of bodily literacy. This lack of bodily literacy, the lack of medically accurate and sexual reproductive health education in public schools is an indication that we don't want to talk about menstruation. That again, it's that taboo subject. In the United States, only 22 schools are required to have medically accurate sexual education in public schools. Canadian schools are not meeting any international standards or best practices or even their own practices for sexuality education.
sexual health education is not even officially provided in schools in Mexico. So all these different examples are really just showing us that when we are not talking about our menstrual health, our sexual health, our reproductive health, it's going to lead to a lack of accurate, comprehensive bodily knowledge. And that results in a disempowerment to obtain access to necessary health services or bodily autonomy to navigate sexual, reproductive, and menstrual health. So... If there is, you know, increased sexual, reproductive, and menstrual phys physical and physiological conditions due to delay or no access to care. So we see that, you know, the discrimination and the lack of bodily literacy is actually manifesting itself in these preventable mortality and morbidity related to gynecological reproductive conditions, as well as other health conditions. Because if folks don't know how to talk about their bodies, don't know how to talk about their menses, their vaginas and their vulvas and their uteruses, then they're unable to speak up about what they need care for. So menstruators are also empowered to make informed consent. If you are told that you cannot talk about menstruation, the one thing that you know is inevitable if that is the body part then you are then automatically disempowered from, from taking any agency in your sexual health or talking about your reproductive health and so you see that also in your relationship um sexually and with, with other people with yourself and so again it really all leads back to the lack of bodily literacy as a tool for again maintaining that menstrual discrimination and violence structure that lack of dignity we deserve the right to know about our bodies and we deserve the right to have access to those resources And now the financial and social burden of menstrual discrimination. So first, in primarily, you can see that the lack of quality and safe menstrual products provided to all menstruators. If we know that menstruation is a inevitable fact of life for half of the population, and we know that menstrual products are a necessity, then why is it that one in five teens cannot offer, uh, aff I'm sorry, afford menstrual products in the United States and Canada? Two countries that, uh, that are in the global North. Why, and why is the feminization of menstrual products? Because it creates that obstacle for non-female menstruators. And this is across the North America. And so you see that things that are of a necessity are still considered to be of something that is a luxury or optional. But if we actually had dignity with menstruation and knew and recognized menstruation as this normal biological phenomenon that needs care and dignity, then menstruation products would be provided for folks that menstruate. You see that also in current with the current menstrual movement and with this idea that menstrual discrimination and restrictions are only about menstrual products and access to, to hygiene, um, hygiene products, you see that the use of menstrual products actually emphasize that menstruation is dirty. So you see the blue blood in advertisements that emphasize the idea of menses as dirty in, in all across North America. Now, why is it that we can see gore and, and you know, murder and sexual assault even on TV, but we are not allowed to see blood on a menstrual pad or a product when we know that, you know, I may not know many of the menstruators here, but I can safely assume that nobody has ever bled blue menstrual blood. And if you have, we would I would love to chat with you. So please send us a chat because I'm quite sure. I would probably bet everything I've ever earned to this day on it. So you see that when you start thinking about the different structures in society and different caveats, you see how prevalent menstrual discrimination is. You see how it, it's, it is present in every layer of society. 75% of young women interviewed um, in, in the USA, young adults, were, had experienced or were afraid of experiencing leaks during menstruation you know, it's quite a high number for something that is inevitably going to happen once in your lifetime or multiple times. I'm sure there are many times when we've woken up with blood in our sheets or blood outside when we're just going about our day and living our life. And so again, why are we being discriminated against something that is a, a natural product of our life? 
So menstrual products are really used as an avenue to reiterate that menstrual blood is portrayed as a social taboo and as the menstruator's responsibility to hide. Whisper. Has anyone ever used the Whisper, Whisper product? Whisper, I'm trying to yell. I would like to yell instead. That's what I would like to do. So why am I whispering about my menstrual product? And all of this really results in an impact of violence against menstruation. On average, there are 400, 433,648 victims aged 12 and older of rape and sexual assault in each year in the United mm. States. One in three women experience sexual assault all across North America, USA, Canada. 375 femicides, which is when a um, person of a female body is killed because simply because they are a female in 2020 alone with increased rates in the pandemic. And we know that the shadow pandemic happening right now on top of, 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 the, of Corona is going to be the rise of domestic violence and interpersonal violences. And so in all of this, we may be asking why is this happening? But if we take a look at what kind of power structure menstrual discrimination and violence creates, then we can see how we've cultivated this type of society and this type of allowance for that violence. Misogynistic beliefs that menstruators are less than non-menstruators, and it's supported by structural institutional beliefs, policies, and the medical system, as well as social values, and it translates to our interpersonal relationship with ourselves and with other menstruators and non-menstruators. So this really cultivates that power dynamic and structure, again, that labels menstruators as weak and um, less than and tabooed and shameful and stigmatized and in and, and inferior and the non-menstruator as superior and powerful and you know able, able to do anything at any point and so how can this not result in creating this type of power structure in which we have um, deliberate acts of violence against mostly against menstruators or other marginalized identities Back to you, Ada. Yes, thank you. Today, we are living in a sort of sad pandemic. The house or the home is not a safe place at all, no matter where we are. One in three women are experiencing various forms of violence globally. They are rape, inter intimate partner violence, physical sexual abuse, silence, deprivation from um, deprivation of food, shelter, education, everywhere the power matters. Why it is happening like this? Mm. Why the why does the home is not a safe place at all? Is it because no one talking about human rights globally? No. Human rights movement started since 19, 1948. Is this because of even not working for ending domestic violence? That is also no. Even has been working directly on domestic violence since 1979, when the CEDA um, appeared in history of uh, women human rights movement. Such level of uh, violence culture is because of the government and NGOs are not working. That also wrong. That many dollars is spending for the research, treatment, legal mechanism, and so on. Is it because of the um, actors are working on gender norms reconstruct the gender norms or uh, an unequal power relationship at family with cultivating say no culture is even called that is also not really the most of the intervention around sexual and gender-based violence have been focusing on response not in prevention we are fostering the culture of silence Why the global community is facing the rape culture? If we see rape critically, 
we will see two different things, one, two different reasons. The most common reason is psychosexual disorder and the other one is deliberately. In between, there will be the thin lining, but it is rare. Usually the, the visible and individual powers place and everywhere victim blame would um, people blame to dress silence and often the cases were mediated um, in, term, in terms of the money and threaten and there are so many reasons that the people do not like to talk about it. This is how the power construct at home and at school. And it is because of the menstrual discrimination. We have been, we means the global committee have been practicing the, um, the silence on menstruation in, in, at family, at school, at workplace and everywhere. The silence and blaming. Oh, this is the woman's business. This is the private business. We should not talk about it, but it has been working um, uh, for constructing power and shaping the power throughout the life cycle. That is why we need to um, need to uh, have a holistic approach to address rape and sexual and gender-based violence across the globe. Let me share the same power construction in other way around. Globally, we have been doing different kind of studies and found that between six to 12 years, the girls and boys learn something about menstruation. They observed a series of behaviors of do and do not aid their family from their mother, sisters, aunts, friends, or movie or books, etc. The girls considered themselves as impure, powerless, and she also started to observe the behavior and also the practice, the behavior, whatever she learned about menstruation. She internalized the fact that the grandmothers do not talk, the mothers do not, did not talk, and finally she also remained silent and become victim. In the meantime, boys considered themselves as a pure, powerful privilege, and they started to um, misuse their power at home. They started to say um, something um, um, bad or verbal abuses or physical abuses at home with their sisters, maybe with the mother, the, in, in schools with their friends, and finally they become perpetrators. So here, I repeat again, the girls converted as a victim and the boys converted as a rapist or perpetrators. This is, their, this is not their mistake. This is the mistake of ours because we never talk about the menstruation. We never talk um, about the differences between um, uh, boy and girl. So this is how the power construct among the girls and boys in Nepal and beyond, but it is heavily overlooked. Of course, there are many factors for power construction, though the menstrual discrimination or menstrual silence or ignorance or biases is one of the most because it is inevitable for more than half of the population. At the some point of time, the more than half of the population have menstruated and it has impact throughout the life cycle. Many scholars claim that the menstrual discrimination is century-based old Hindu practice. It is myth. If we go to the major religions globally, um, like Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism, everywhere, the menstrual blood considered somehow impure or dirty directly or indirectly. Likewise, if we see critically which country follows menstrual restriction. In many, many uh, um, research reports and international media highlighted that, especially the countries from global south, like Nepal, um, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, are practicing the menstrual restriction. But if we go through the details, everywhere, 
the mutual taboos, stigma, restrictions, discriminations are practicing globally. In Australia, 25% girls are afraid even to buy the mutual product. Eight out of 10 women are hiding the menstruation and they avoid swimming and using light cloths, hiding menstrual product in their sleeves or bras. They also um, remain fail in class because of the menstrual stigma. It is happening same way, more or less same way in Europe. For example, half of the women say that they feel un uncomfortable in social situation during the menstruation. And in, this is the research from one report and 16% uh, of them have described missing the school during menstruation. It is happening in same manner in Europe, in UK as well. One in Eight women did not know about the periods until they started the menstruation. My colleagues, um, Millie has already explained about the experience from North America, so I do not like to repeat here. Let's um, observe the practices on menstruation in South America. There is a food restriction, restriction on torch use, restriction on mobility or participation in, in few countries like Ecuador or um, Argentina. Likewise, in Africa, uh, there are many countries, Burundi, Egypt, East Wantini, Sierra Leone, Burundi, Nigeria, Eritrea, South Sudan, Niger, Ghana, Congo, they also have been following various types of restriction during menstruation. They also consider menstrual bodies impure, dirty, and bad for, for, the, for the human being and the plant. In Asia, there are many countries. These are the, only the examples in Afghanistan, Bhutan, Bangladesh, um, Cyprus, Kyrgyzstan, Nepal, everywhere menstrual restrictions have been practic practicing. These are the some examples. Why do people, um, global people keep talking, about, keep using the word of the period instead of the menstruation? Or sanitary product instead of the menstrual product? Neither the menstrual blood is dirty, nor the uh, pads or tampons are the sanitary uh, product like soap or, or the cleaner. Why do we be using this kind of vocabularies while explaining the menstruation and menstrual products? Are we really empowering the people or menstruators or de demonizing them by using this kind of words or trying to escape the real situation or real issues where the menstruators experience uh, disempowered and demonization in their daily lives. There is another example from UK. This is a very recent report shows that nine in 10 people, 10 menstruators experience anxiety during menstruation. In summary, we can say that menstrual taboos, stigma, discrimination, violence, manifested with a different name, forms and magnitude. I always explain that for, for greetings, or some, some people say good morning, some people say namaste or bonjour or guten morgen or hola, something like that. The menstruation also have a different name, different forms, some were visible, some were not visible, some were very severe, some were mild or some were moderate. But there are the, um, taboo and stigma discrimination across the globe. Generally, they, they considered impure or dirty to the menstrual blood, menstruating person or woman, um, and the, the things, whatever the menstruators have been using, like torch, eat, or whatever the activities menstruator um, does, these all considered impure, dirty, or bad luck. Usually, they do not um, allow to touch the people somewhere, place somewhere, plants. And they also not allow to eat somewhere citrus fruit, somewhere milk, somewhere vegetables, somewhere 
um, uh, of particular fruits and likewise they also not allowed to mobile or participate as their wish uh, for example in entered into the house or kitchen bedroom same bedroom or participate in cultural activities or meetings these are the things we can see from earlier discussion as well let's um, discuss about the impact of menstrual discrimination on education because of the menstrual uh, discrimination the the menstruators deprived from touch mobility participation or eating because of this kind of restriction they um, affected emotionally they they distracted they they, they they experience stress nervousness anxiety and they they started to live with a low self esteem demonization humiliation and gradually in the beginning they are so smart by nature their brain um, is more more grown and they have more ability to fight with the um, uh, any uh, kind of disease or immune system but later because of the restriction they deprive from the eating putting poor touching and um, they deprive deprive from the emotional emotionally grown up and um, eventually they, they 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 started to um, uh, live with the poor, poor 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 mental health uh, humiliation and they start to focus less in class they remain absent when they started uh, to when they have the menstruation they start to remain absent in classroom and gradually they fell in a class and and finally they drop out from the school some uh, um, um, encounter the suicide some encounter the early marriage some just um, uh, dismiss their their uh, uh, dreams here i also like to recall the power construction um, uh, what i shared in the beginning when the goal um, is about 6 to 10 years during that time she considered herself as a impure dirty powerless and by the because of the menstrual discrimination from the observation in family and in schools or in neighborhood there will be about 6 to 8 years before having a menstruation it uh, on her life so the the feeling of powerlessness feeling of the dehumanization feeling of inferiority <laughs> has already so much strong i my own ya me exit na di na ren so likewise there is a impact on health from the menstrual discrimination as well um they, they especially they they deprive from the um, having appropriate or adequate nutrition in, in their lives and um, psychologically they are traumatized and uh, eventually they become physically weak uh, they um, are suffering from chronic malnutrition other gastrointestinal sickness anemia and so on we we also discuss uh, while we talk about the health uh, there should be the um, well being from the perspective of the physical mental social and spiritual well being is defined by the who and because of the restrictions um, um, on mobility participation um, these uh, elements of the health also um, impacted uh, in different range some um, women um, um, commit suicide some um, experience infectious diseases related with the reproductive and sexual health some commit suicide some um, ended with the depression some um, ended with the child marriage so there are different kinds of um, health uh, related issues also uh, connect with the menstrual discrimination I like this slide always. This is very complex. It shows that the menstruation is 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 a is a biological, natural, in inevitable phenomena, but it is very complex. When we see from the perspective of the social, cultural, economical, political, environmental perspective, 
it is very complex. Because of the menstrual discrimination, the menstruators deprived from having food, um, having uh, mobility, having um, uh, uh, torch as their wish, and they, they experience different kind of um, uh, negative consequences immediate at their life, at immediate as well as, as, well as long term. Usually, at the global level, the global community have been working in few sectors like conflict mitigation, empowering uh, women empowerment, promotion of the human rights, or um, improvement of reproductive health. But unless and until we do not talk about the um, menstrual discrimination or menstruation, um, these kind of activities are just floating, um, floating on tip of the iceberg. The, the underlying it is very the underlying cause is menstrual discrimination is over, um, is overlapping each other interconnecting each other and it is very complex and it is very multifaceted that is why um, while implementing the activities we have to think in holistic approach if we keep distributing the menstrual product uh, or if we keep talking or educating in e schools on menstruation, if we keep to, um, distributing the sanitary pads free, or if we promoting the clean uh, clean shelters, that really doesn't help to um, address the um, multifaceted issue of menstrual discrimination. If we um, um, go through the global discourse of human rights, now we have been are talking about the dignity or human rights since 1948. There are many international human rights declarations, um, uh, but we, we are not uh, addressing directly about the pain, struggle, stories of the menstruators. These stories, pains, struggles often ignored, overlooked, or misinterpreted. I like this slide always. Even define sexual and gender-based violence is any act that is perpetrated against a person's will. This is the UN's definition for sexual and gender-based violence. The tiabos, stigma, restriction, discrimination, abuses, violence associated with menstruation is a form of sexual and gender-based violence. If you disagree with me, let's uh, have a look. According to the UN, the physical violence includes physical assault, punishment for defying cultural norms, rape, attempted rape, uh, sorry, under the sexual abuse, rape, attempted rape, sexual harassment, etc. Under the emotional violence, verbal abuse, confinement, social exclusion, humiliation, and denial of access to resources and services. So, during the menstruation, the menstruators denial of access or they, they deprive from going to school or work or industry or, or praying in temple or mosque or, or uh, anywhere. They also deprive from um, having access with the water sources or having food or fruits. So these are the some examples uh, which are the form of sexual and genderist violence created by the menstrual discrimination, no matter the menstruator sleeps. We also keep talking about the um, reproductive health, sexual and reproductive health. Especially the WHO is the pioneer for it. And when the ICPG conference um, held in 1994, it is already 25 years. And since then, we keep talking about the sexual and reproductive health. There are nine elements, the, according to the latest um, strategy uh, released by WHO in 2019, but there is no menstruation at all. Menstruation is linked everywhere. No matter whether we you talk about family planning or safe person or reproductive cancers or, or infertility, but there is no ex, ex, explicit um, discussion and its its dimension 
in on under the reproductive and uh, sexual health without talking about the menstruation the girls do not have a confidence to talk or to demand the safe abortion service let me give uh, one example from nepal the rate of unsafe abortion is higher than the uh, safe abortion why it is happening it is happening because of the stigma the girl who cannot talk about the menstruation cannot uh, ask for the menstrual pad how could she go and find the certified uh, health workers for the safe abortion or if anyone looking for the uh, infertility care center how she can um, go and um, ask for the service or if the um, the people do not uh, talk about the menstruation how that person can talk about the treatment um, for hiv or sti so this is a very complex the menstruation is some somehow it is everywhere but the and and nowhere as well we simply talk about the biological phenomena of the menstruation how it occurs but unless and until we do not talk um, we do not discuss about the uh, social cultural political economical environmental aspect of the um, uh, menstruation our, our menstrual movement uh, uh, will be incomplete at all and as a result Uh, the the, the uh, rampant uh, culture of uh, the rapist culture also um, cannot um, eliminate this is how we believe i don't know how many of you are aware about this the um, un uh, security council resolution 13, 1325 it talks about the four p that means participation in, women's participation in decision making uh, prevention of all forms of violence protection of sexual violence and post -re conflict recovery <coughs> sorry in many in many um, cultures in many um, um, communities menstruators cannot participate in a kitchen cannot participate um, uh, the first uh, parliament uh, um, or, or 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 kitchen or dining table how these women can participate in a parliament because we have already discussed the practices of uh, uh, menstruation across the globe and they cannot go to the kitchen they cannot cook they cannot uh, have a food when they feel hungry now when they um, they cannot go and bring the water uh, when they feel thirsty so in this situation how could we um, um, um uh, claim that the uh, women can play the vital role in parliament or peace talk so there is a um, thin um, lining between the peace uh, building and the um, uh, participation as well since 2015 globally we keep talking about the uh, sustainable development goals globally um and there are nine uh goals are directly uh, linked with the menstruation mens mens but uh, when we talk about the good health and well being or goal number 3 uh, or goal number 4 or goal number 5 we often talk about the menstruation but but if you go through the target there is no explicit uh, target uh, for, for the uh, menstrual dignity and without uh, having the a uh, menstrual uh, menstruation friendly environment in office or in a garment factory how could um, um, the country can achieve the target on the economic empowerment or youth employment or eliminating the slavery or human trafficking so we only very we are looking men many organizations are pro promoting for the clean set product um, but these are not enough to address the all uh, issues related with the menstruation because um, the, they may have the fast internet they may have the 
uh, television in their room. Uh, they may have live in the five star standard hotel, um, uh, standard house. They may have the choices for the mineral product, but if they cannot go to the kitchen when they feel hungry, if they cannot participate in a, in, in a cultural activities or in a school, or the, if they cannot eat the fruits and vegetables as their wish, uh, the, their human right um, would violate, would be violated. Or, or they live with the dehumanization. So these kind of things we need to think very critically in a very deeper level. Menstruation is not only the HTML blur. Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation, we advocating for menstrual talk dignity. First, this is the slogan uh, for the 2020 as well, because um, uh, menstrual product, and cleanliness do not guarantee the right to dignity, mobility, towards uh, it um, um, as, as the menstruator wish. And likewise, I like to recall one um, case from Kenya. The 14 years girls commit suicide in uh, September 2019 at e school when um, she had a first menstruation. Whereas her government had already started to distribute the free sanitary, free menstrual product uh, in Kenya. So, unless and until we do not uh, deconstruct the myth, tabos, uh, stigma, uh, rumors around menstruation, uh, we cannot empower, we cannot um, promote the human right of the menstruators. In this figure, there are everything, the, the management of the waste, waste product, I mean the uh, management of the uh, used mineral product for disposal, freely uh, available of the mineral product, even in the toilet or pharmacy everywhere. But unless and until the, um, there is no discussion, there is no dialogue, there is no way to uh, achieve the uh, goal of the uh, empowerment or human right. And if we keep talking about the uh, uh, menstrual hygiene or hygiene or pad, 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 something like that, it also gives the uh, negative, um, it sounds positive, but it has emphasizing the negative message like menstrual blood is impure or dirty and we have to hide it. If we go through the global movement, uh, there are a couple of things uh, have been ha happening since uh, uh, 2018. Uh, but um, this moment, like Oscar or Padman movie, created the space for the menstruation or breaking the silence. However, the, the, the bigger portion or dignity is still missing um, in, in a global discourse as well. And if we go through the more critically, um, the, the menstrual rights, uh, at the name of the menstrual rights discussed in academia, menstrual health management started to use by UNICEF and WHO since 2012. And menstrual hygiene management started to use by UNESCO and UN since 2014. And dignified menstruation started to use um, by Nepal government since 2017. If we go through uh, this slide again, this is the, I, I like this slide. Since the times of Homo sapiens or 4 billion years, the menstruation exists in this universe, but um, we have, um, we, we, it remains as a dirty, pollutant, poisonous, bad luck and impure and everywhere is silence and ignorance. This is how even today we are living in 21st century, but um, we, we, we still living with the deep um, uh, level of ignorance, silence and taboo um, uh, about the menstruation. Because of the menstruation, this universe exists and we are, we are not acknowledging the essence of the menstruation yet. That is why, um, we, 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 we come up with the idea of the dignified menstruation or menstrual dignity. It is a state of free from any forms of abuse, discrimination, violence, um, restriction associated with the menstruation. That means there should not be difference between 25 days to five days um, uh, in terms of the discrimination. Uh, usually we define by three Ps. The 
first P is the principally menstruation has to consider from the lens of human right and it is a political concern. It is everyone's business. It is not only the women's business. And under the practical, practically, second P, um, the menstruation has to consider from home to tomb even after the death. In some cultures, the death uh, rituals are different between men and female because they menstruate. And why the sex uh, selective abortion keep happening? Because there is a cycle of the uh, menstrual impurity. That is why the women consider lesser and powerless or inferior. That is why they also less value when they are on home or during the time of the pregnancy. So um, we need to see in a very holistic approach because menstruation is not only about the reproductive age issue. It has to go throughout the life cycle pre-menopause, menopause, um, 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 during the elder age, what kind of, is, what is the status of the uterus or breast or any hormonal issues related to the menstruation. So that kind of things have to consider while we talk about the dignified menstruation. If we go through the sector wise, there should be integrated approach among the health, education, empowerment, women rights, environment, so we can address the all forms of um, uh, uh, discrimination um, of, uh, which uh, uh, exaggerated or which come from the menstrual practice. Third P is power or psychologically, reconstruction of the power, because the power construct it at home at the age of five, six, seven years. And we need to discuss about our existence. So the girls considered herself that um, she has a ability of menstruation um, and, and she feel pride and power. At the meantime, boys also um, learn that, the, that they born because of the uh, menstruation, because of the omen. So if they understand that kind of um, things or, or dialogue on menstruation since childhood, it, it helps to cultivate the culture of justice. And as, as a result, the, the girls feel confidence and they, they, they grown up or they socialize with this high level of um, self-esteem, uh, self-determination since childhood. And eventually she can, she would have a bargaining capacity or negotiation capacity at home, at school, at our place and everywhere. If she can say no with her brother or with her mother or father uh, when she, she is in home, she can say no at school if school uh, teacher or any friends do bad touch to her or if something wrong uh, uh, with her partner or husband in future. So dignified menstruation is all about changing the narratives from impurity to impurity, hygiene to dignity, five days bleeding to um, lifelong approach, women's or private business to everyone business or political concern, and the gender policy to dignified menstruation friendly policy because we, we keep, we means globally, we keep talking about the gender policy, gender strategies, gender framework, and, and the menstruation is, is, is nowhere. Uh, the menstruation, the, the, the needs and priorities of the menstruators have been um, uh, uh, not recognized uh, by the gender policies. That is why if we really like to work on peace, empowerment, human rights, SDG, we need to redefine our strategies um, and it, is, it, is, it should go beyond the gender policies. However, the, the, depending on the context, in terms of the socio-political, cultural um, uh, context, there should be some specific you know, strategies also need to uh, implement to, um, to achieve the overarching goal of the uh, equality or empowerment. Since 2019, we started the uh, International Dignified Menstruation Day um, for 8th December. Many people um, questioned 
us that why we need the dignified menstruation day and why it is for the 8th December. Let me uh, share a few ideas about it. First, menstrual taboos, stigma, restriction, abuses are the forms of sexual and gender-based violence as defined by the UN. And it is a violation of the human rights. It is a crime. Second, menstrual discrimination is practicing across the globe in various names, forms, and magnitude. And menstrual discrimination is playing a vital role to construct the power and shaping the power. That is why it is very relevant to talk during the 16 days activism, which starts from November 25th and ended in December 10th. And menstrual discrimination, um, 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 December is the, is the month of the uh, Human Rights Month, and menstrual discrimination is, is, is work as a uh, cause and effect. Let me give one example how it is a cause and effect. Because of the menstrual discrimination, the, the um, education, the quality of education decreased due to remain absent or, non, or failing in class or due to stigma or uh, not having appropriate infrastructure in a school. And gradually later she, she fell in a class and she, she um, dropped out from the school. And after drop out from the school, she either uh, trap on a child marriage or forced marriage, or she engage in a low profile uh, income activity. So, so there are multiple things um, playing each other because of the mutual discrimination happening in the family or society. Now, Millie. Me? Yes. Hi. Perfect. And so here we've really cultivated this understanding of global stigma, shame, taboo, and violence against menstruation and menstruators. And we, as the Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation, have been successful in some ways, you know, working as a grassroots organization and entirely volunteer based in Nepal, we have collaborated with the government of Nepal and the National Human Rights Commission to convey the International Workshop for Dignified Menstruation. And this has this is the second International Dignified Menstruation um, conference that we have put together. And that happened um, last year in December 2020. And this ran from December 8th, our day of dignified menstruation to December 10th, which is the International Human Rights Day. And so this three part series had about a thousand participants that spanned over 30 different countries. And there we also launched our practical handbook on dignified menstruation. And that is actually available widely in, in, um, in Amazon, also in other websites. And it's the book that Radha is holding right now. And so this is a really a practical handbook for either individuals or for organizations or governmental agencies to really understand how can one adopt dignified menstruation into their framework if the goal is to really eliminate this type of violence and the associated impact with it. And so um, in this conference, we also launched our declaration and this is a robust dynamic declaration that really, again, is urging us to look at and change the current menstrual movement and adopt the dignified menstruation framework so that we can, you know, gradually or, you know, not gradually, you know, I really feel like um, so oftentimes that progress is seen as a gradual thing, but people are dying now. And so that's why there's an urgency for dignified menstruation. So we'll quickly go ahead and go through the declaration now, and there will be a space available to sign the link to commit to the declaration as well. And if you need any support in adopting it, please feel free to reach out to us. So first, and the main, is to redefine their narrative on menstruation. 
from charity to human rights, hygiene to dignity, impure to life-giving, and from, again, not only the five days that one bleeds or for one's reproductive years, but for a full life course from premenstrual to menstrual to your reproductive reproducing years to perimenopause and menopausal years. Second, to protect one's fundamental rights to human dignity, not allowing anyone to deny or stigmatize these, and therefore fully embrace the right to menstruate with dignity. Three, de-link dignity in menstruation from global efforts to colonize, own, direct, or subvert the narrative, so that each menstruator has the fundamental right to menstruate freely. So we really have to, again, give the reins over and to build a movement from the most marginalized. Four, stitch together the different sector silos. Again, menstruators do not live in isolation in health and, and education and then livelihood or water, but really we need a holistic and a humanized centered life cycle approach so that we're really addressing the specific needs of each menstruator in all of these different layers so that there can be dignity in each layer. Radha, if you want to move the slide for me. Might be having some technical issues. Yeah, it's not. Um, are you able to maybe stop sharing and I, that I can share? Yeah, you see it. Okay, are you able uh. to stop? While Radha is working on that, I will read from it from a different slide. Five, it is to walk the talk of human dignity with and by non-menstruators, which often are cis men and boys. So non-menstruators must be willing to be active advocates and must be willing to not only, you know, to support and to advocate, but to, again, to be active participants in dismantling this menstrual discrimination and violent system. Six, and I love this one. Don't be shy. Menstrual indignity is a manifestation of patriarchy. So refuse it and fight it. And I love this one because it's really speaking to the fact that this is another prong of patriarchy and misogyny. And it's really another way of performing the subversion of menstruators. And so do not be shy. Your dignity is your human right. Seven, tell the story far and wide to redefine research as we know it. We need to center marginalized folks and survivors and their storytelling so we can know what is needed to be prioritized. Turn media stereotypes on their head. Eight, this is really that media and other, other agencies in the public lead in public health sector, social justice, have a responsibility to really give verified information and to advocate for equity and justice at large instead of being complicit in the oppression. Nine. Nine, to seek intergenerational investment to change heart and minds as opposed to a single term project funding. Again, this is not a helicopter job project. It cannot be something that we do for others. It must be a life work. 10, democratize information and stories in a myriad of languages. So here it's that because we are global and we have a global understanding, we must be able to share information freely and give this kind of holistic informed consent freely to people from all different cultures and languages. So it must be accessible. 11, recognize and fight mental discrimination and indignity as a symptomatic of a widely tolerated silent pandemic of gender-based violence and inequality that continues across the life course of women, girls, non-binary, gender diverse people denying them full and free life. I had to read that one. That one is really, again, we are urging you to understand menstrual discrimination and violence as a 
as a violent of our human rights, of our inalienable human rights, and to understand that this is a form of gender-based violence. And again, like as Radha said, it is both a cause and effect. It is both a cause of gender-based violence and is also is a form of gender-based violence. And therefore, we must recognize it as such so that we can start actually doing the work for it. And 12, it says develop where necessary and implement where already present progressive legislative and policy frameworks at the national, regional, international levels. And this speaks to the fact that we must first recognize this as a infringement of our human right so that we can create that necessary research um, informed by the community and by folks who are who are the most impacted that can translate into valid and comprehensible legislative work and programs interventions that actually work towards mitigating these insidious menstrual discrimination and violence. So if you'd like to sign our declaration and you, resi and you reside with any of these, then reach out to us and sign on the form as well. And now we are coming to an end of our urgency for dignified menstruation. And again, this is just a opening into the dialogue and by no, no means is it an end. So we'd like to open the floor up for any questions, anyone from um, our Facebook Live to anyone from um, that has joined us today and in the Zoom meeting. And you can either raise your hand and speak out loud or you could type on the chat box. Any questions, comments, concerns? Any random thoughts? And rather, do we know if we have any from Facebook? Doubling back to one of our um, declarations, we must not be shy. We must be, be open to talking about these dialogues. Yeah, please um, unmute yourself and you, you can ask questions or if you have a language problem, you just type over there in chat box and we will respond accordingly. We also constantly check the Facebook page, Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation and uh, we will respond accordingly. Yes, I was just asking, it is always very difficult to talk to women who have this mindset that it's wrong, it is taboo, it is, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And deal with the people like in the villages and stuff, you need to go and change their mindset. And that is very difficult to achieve. It's okay to go to schools because they are trained, especially in India, you're trained to listen to whatever is being said to you. And you take it back home and then the school gets, parents will start calling and say, why is this being taught and stuff like that. I remember doing a menstrual cycle uh, presentation and this one girl was sitting there and she refused. She says, I'm feeling uncomfortable and she wanted to leave. And I had to convince her that no, listen through the whole thing and then find out. Then there were teachers. There is a teacher who, who did not, she skipped the whole reproductive chapter from her uh, and she's an educated person. She skipped the whole reproductive chapter and said, this, this chapter you guys read at home. So you know what I'm saying? It, it's like how there's got to be, you, you've done the fantastic job of putting it on 8th December where people start concentrating and bringing out the fact that menstruation is not being talked about even in all these major SDGs and programs and stuff like that. So how do you have a solution for that? How to approach women? Lily, you go and I will catch up. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you so much for, for that comment. Is it Zareen? Yes. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you so much for that. That's really critical. And, you know, again, we go back to saying that 
there's that internalization of menstrual discrimination and stigma and violence, right? So another type of violence that's being perpetrated here is the violence to ourselves. And like you were mentioning, a lot of these are educators or are menstruators who are, you know, still are perpetrating this violence against other menstruators by not allowing them to know the information. And so for that, again, it, that change has to come, you know, one in all different forms because it's so multifaceted and it requires that multi-prong approach. So one is that education, those members will have to be re-educated and they'll have to unlearn all of their stigma and their shame because it's clear it is their own shame and stigma what is causing them to, you know, not teach the, 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 the other students. As well as you see that, you know, parents are being, you know, parents are angry about their kids being taught this because they want them to follow a certain structure. I think as educators, it is our duty to provide information and to provide accurate information and to empower the students. And so in this, I think you just simply don't have a lot of control over other people, but the school does, right? The school can be like, no, you have to teach reproductive health if you're going to go to the school. So then that comes that other prong, right? One prong is the actual educator being educated about what they should be doing. Then the other, the, the second prong comes from the school's legislation and policies to dictate that, no, you must teach medically accurate information. It does not matter if you do not want to teach it, then you cannot teach here, right? So all these multi-pronged approaches must be taken as well as parents should be, you know, parents could also be told by the school, hey, your, your child goes to school here and they will be learning about everything. We will not be discriminating against menstrual health because it is stigmatized in society. So, and, and, this, and this will only be easier if we're start having that dialogue about menstruation. So I really think it requires that multi-pronged approach and, and, and we hear you because we really encounter that as well in our, in our work in advocacy. The positive part of it was that my husband took the class and that's how we found out okay. that she had not taught the class. Wow. And it was a biology class. So we were helping out at the school. We are not, uh, I mean, in that way. Yeah. Way we yes. uh, there. But this girl watched us all this, but the, uh, the, the boys in the commerce section and the girls, they don't know it for them. And so my husband talked to the principal and said, we'll do it for the whole school. And that's where the teachers were hesitating to come and attend and said, oh, I have a class and all. I said, I'll take your class, you go and attend this. And the students of the upper job of covering everything, menstruation, child, child, uh, you know, death, fetus, infanticide, all that stuff. They... Uh, thank you. All thank you. The... Thank you yeah. Jarin. I saw you online right now. Would you like to respond to Jarin or I, you allow me to speak a bit? Uh, hi, Rana. Do you like response to Jarin's? Uh, next question, I am. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jarin. Um, I do agree. Uh, it is very complex. It is very difficult. Um, um, actually, what we personally me, what um, we I am thinking, in a course of human rights development and feminism movement we do not talk about the menstruation. There is a very deep level of silence. We talk about the our body, our rights since 1973, and but we don't talk about the menstruation. We talk about the contraceptives, but we don't talk about the menstruation. So this is how the menstruation is, is remain very deep and near level of the silence globally. And that is why when we don't talk, there are so many assumptions, misinterpretation keep coming everywhere, no matter whether you live in the USA or Australia or Nepal. So I just come from the field, just yesterday night, I, I back to Kathmandu. Um, what I learned that not only this study trip, from my 40 years experience, since I do, I'm fighting, I'm working on the menstruation. At the age of the seven, 
um, I was traumatized, deeply traumatized from the conversation, from the practice of the menstrual discrimination in my family. And later I knew that it is not only in my family, it is across the globe. And now I realize that we, we never talk about it. Talking means I'm not uh, seeking the entire definition or physiology of the menstruation. Simply, it is a normal natural phenomenon, like a, like a must, um, uh, mustache uh, uh, among the boys. We don't talk about the menstruation, and thus it created the assumption. And there are so many myths, remorse, uh, misinterpretation, misperception going around. That is why we are suffering so much. And the the most the most um, uh, different, uh, most um, common thing, we keep talking about the patriarchy, masculinity, oh, everything is gender discrimination, gender in, in inequality, just because of the uh, patriarchy. How we define, how can we define the patriarchy? If you talk patriarchy in many countries, they, they, they consider something uh, uh, negatively and something, it, it is the opposition of the men. And this is how our conversation is so much narrow. We try to move on, but our our movement is, is getting so narrow, so, so restricted. So if we talk directly menstruation, the difference between men and female is because of the uterus. If, if we start that kind of thing and breaking the silence, brush the myth uh, in a very informal setting from the childhood, I think we can make uh, it happen. And obviously, if we, if we include the situation in classroom, in schools, everywhere, because many, many uh, organizations, we keep doing the webinar in fortnightly uh, basis uh, for the global community and people said, oh, this is, this is not important for us. This is not important. This is only important for the women. And so that kind of thing, things, why it is keep coming? Because we are not ready to understand. We are not ready to unpack the power construction. And the menstruation is a very invisible, uh, very inevitable, a uh, very strong form of the power construction. So uh, we are learning every day. And and we don't know. We don't have any any uh, uh, white and uh, black and white answer. But uh, from your questions, uh, we keep learning. And if you have any document, any research, any ideas, please feel free to share. We have already shared our uh, email address, and you just uh, visit the dignifiedmission.org, and we can continue our dialogue at the global level, regional level, and the national level as well. Thank you very much. Next question. I saw the question. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zareen. Uh, so I did see a question rather. I saw Simin. I saw Simin who asked the question, what steps or specific subjects you recommend us to start individual dialogues and awareness among the people we meet or know? Inta, did you want to take that one? Yes. Uh, uh, specific subjects means uh, the section of the topic. So, right. So we, think... Yes, but, uh, from in Sri Lanka, we are starting through the study circles to give some uh, introduction about the menstruation to the boys and girls. Specifically, now we are starting to. Uh, you uh, use the medical faculty students also to give the uh, inputs to the um, uh, local community youths. Uh, specifically, we are targeting the over 18 years to 24 years uh, old uh, youths because they, they, they are able to easily access to the schools to give the awareness program. So that's better thing than now. Uh, they are also little shyness to talk about this, but however, the teachers are mo motivating them to uh, talk about these things. I think that's the uh, initial stage. Better to talk about the what is menstruation, then what's the uh, cycle of the menses, then uh, what's the difference between the uh, girls and boys. So that's the uh, subjects will be start little by little to talk about more things. I think that's the, 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 this is the normal thing. The study circle is the, our basic tool to talk about these things. Uh, then the media also, we are using the, some of the uh, magazines to talk about the, these like subjects. Uh, then better to do some training programs to 
the particular group uh, team to talk about this openly. Yes, Millie, you can continue. Yeah. Thank you. Mary, can I? Based on, based on our experience, no matter whether the boys or girls live in Australia or Canada or USA or Nepal, in between the age of five to 12, they know something about menstruation, which is disgusting, which is negative. That means the power, powerful or powerlessness is, is constructed between that age five to two years. That means we have to reach out our conversation or dialogue on menstruation at that age. And for that, it is very simple. We need to include the, the conversation on menstruation into the parental education or primary education, Montessori education. So the parents start to talk about the menstruation by showing their pictures or the simple, the, the anatomy. Because that during that age, if you go through the psychosocial approach, in that is they do not know the bad or good. They do not know the entire physiology, but they know something about the difference between men and women. So that is why we need to reach out at that level. Simple. We don't need any project. The, the, the movement, whatever we have been doing by Global South Coalition for Dignified Mission is a very entirely volunteer movement. And we simply invite people, appealing people to have a dialogue on dignified menstruation by putting the simple uh, tag, you are welcome in dignified menstruation friendly office. Or, or, or house or something like that. So that created the space to talk about the menstruation or to talk about your, your, your genitalia or, or to talk about the human existence, no matter whether you um, are girl or woman or trans men or queer or something like that. So once we have a confidence with our body, it is easier to talk about the transgender issue, the rape, the, the intimate partner violence, or family planning contraceptive, or, inter, or other kind of issues related with the uh, gender you know, gender unequal norms and power uh, uh, relationship within, within the family, within the partner, within the society and everywhere. Of course, we need the policy. If you ask to me in Nepal, the five ministries have been working simultaneously since 2017. The most, most importantly, the Ministry of Women is working a lot to dismantle the uh, rumors, restrictions, and uh, promoting the human rights. Um, uh, the, the Ministry of Water Supply more focus on the dignified menstruation friendly infrastructure, water supply. Ministry of Health more focusing on uh, psychosocial counseling and treating the uh, menstruation related health issues like dysmenorrhea, backache or something like that. And Ministry of Education focusing in school curriculum, formal and informal curriculum. And in informal curriculum, it has been just recently indoors from the grade four to grade 10. So grade 10, that means 10 to 11 years old uh, uh, girls uh, and boys have to know about their body and their responsibility to their colleagues. And if they have, uh, understand the, the logic of being, being born in this universe due to the essence of the menstruation, obviously that boy start to respect that girl or her, his mother instead of the, uh, dominating or suppressing her. This is how we are trying to you know, work through the Ministry of Education. In top of that, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, we have two ministries the, under the same umbrella. This ministry more focusing on the product. The product products should be the people friendly uh, because many products use the chemicals and few few plastic uh, plastic uh, uh, originated products uh, take place 200 to 1000 years to decay and it is not friendly for the environment so five ministries have been working tirelessly on dignified menstruation though long way to go and other ministries also um, incorporate as a cross cutting issue for example if the group is is if the um, the uh, women's group related with the agriculture group or forest users group, they also have to talk about the menstruation because during menstruation, the menstruators cannot participate in a meeting or any rituals 
or or cannot uh, um, uh, access with the water resources that means it has to talk everywhere it is everyone business because it is a human right and political issue this is how we are we have been working and we on encourage to have a dialogue everywhere don't separate because we cannot separate the menstruation we cannot separate the universe that is why let's make the menstruation everywhere wherever we are yes love that so much and um i just wanted to chime in and say that we are nearing the end we have about 20 minutes left just to let everybody know on the zoom session and uh we had another question that i thought was um quite great so Anna asked, how can we start to unlearn our own shame and stigma towards menstruation and empower ourselves? I really like this question because I've always considered myself someone who has been, you know, passionate about sexual health and reproductive health for all of my life. And I felt that way because coming from a culture that was maybe more, um, more conservative, I have felt as though, you know, purity is something that we always had to upheld. And so I always knew that I wanted to do, I, I just naturally had this, you know, feeling that I wanted to be a champion for sexual and reproductive health for myself so that I can access those, but also for others. But I never in my, I must have already been 22 when I, when I first met Radha and I never thought about menstruation ever. I did so many classes. I taught, I was a teacher. I was a sexual health educator for so many years talking about sexual health, talking about access, desegmentation, all of these things. And, you know, I studied public health. I did all these things, but I still never thought about menstruation. And that is deliberate. And that's what we are trying to say. You feeling shame and stigmatized and tabooed and not knowing and feeling like you don't know about menstruation and you have all of these, um, all of these disempowerment around it. It is... Uh, intentional violence of the state. It is a violence perpetrated by the state and by the people. And so to overcome it is to, in the short answer, is to one, follow us on our social media, to join our conversations on dignified menstruation, to educate yourself through different seminars such as these, as well as through lots of books. You can you can also take a look at the practical handbook. There's lots of, um, you know, just free content and also training materials. And really, again, is education and literacy is the way for total and complete liberation and autonomy and that can only come after we we know what is the actual truth right and even after that it's you really have to accept that you again deserve that inalienable human right so until and unless you know that you deserve that every step just becomes harder but when you start accepting that when you know that you deserve that inalienable human right, but you are being deprived of that right, then after that, there is nothing else. Then you are going to be the educator and you educate everybody in your life in that way. But it's a process. And that's something that, you know, organizations such as ours are here for because, and truth, truth be told, there are not many because this dialogue is something that has been started, but nothing that has been amplified and that is what we are asking for is for you to join uh, this fight towards dignity and towards prioritizing that thank yeah, you for that. The, uh, one statement and to initiate the dialogue on dignified menstruation just let's just share the stories successful stories like mili like radha like into like someone from philippines just let's share the sto successful stories that inspire to to test herself First, first, it is a very. It is not like other uh, empowerment process. It is. It is something different. It is. It is all about the personal thing. Whether you are ready or not to deconstruct your your mindset. This is very important. All the time, we development workers or NGO workers pointing others and forcing others to follow what we said. But in the menstrual dignified menstruation journey, we are pointing yourself. Are you ready? Are you ready for deconstruct the ideas what you believe and what you are you have been practicing at first during the menstruation? I participate in a in a death ritual, which is which is which is the the glass ceiling in in my culture. So so we have to be ready. We have to be prepared. And for that, we need to um, get the successful story all around the globe. Thank you.
The chat box is very chatty. It's great. <laughs> Uh, Anna, I, I like your question again. It says, thank you. I'm from the UK. And there's definitely an awkward attitude towards menstruation as an uncomfortable topic instead of embrace and celebrate it. Yeah. And we do have um, folks that are in, you know, in the UK who have a chapter there and Australia and they do, they do see experience a lot of that, especially here in North America as well. And for that, you know, I think the awkward kind of a feeling that people have towards it that again you know is in any in in that spectrum is again that discrimination and that stigma because if you are awkward talking about your menses you're definitely not going to tell me if there's something wrong with your vagina you're definitely not going to talk to me if you have something going on in, in your in your uterus or your ovaries and I see that in my work um, I work as a reproductive health specialist at a clinic and I see that with folks who cannot name their body parts you know folks who have been alive in this earth for many more years you know it's 70 80 and we still cannot talk about our, our breasts and our uteruses and anything so you know, it's kind of like, we're like, oh, it's not so bad. You know, we have products here, we have this and that, but do we, do we have dignity? Again, do we have dignity if I cannot talk about it? I don't. Yeah, and um, I was in UK in 2018, um, in March, 2018 or 19, 18. And I was invited to several colleges and the schools. And I remember one school, um, gathered only the girls to to have an interaction with me about the menstruation. And I was shocked. In my principle, I always ensure 40% uh, of male participation in our conversation or training all the time. And in UK, I didn't see the boys in a classroom. And I, I asked to the principal and principal said, oh, boys don't like to have a discussion. It's not important for them. And I was shocked. And that was proven by many research already. I, I shared the one research report from UK just from last January. The nine uh, uh, women feel anxiety, experience anxiety during the menstruation in UK. So that means it is it is uh, it is a silence everywhere. It is an ignored issue everywhere. And um, the, in the UK, the poor period poverty is very, very much um, uh, evolving uh, campaign. I do appreciate it. But again, indirectly, it, it, it is, it is uh, pointing to the people who are living in the global south. Oh, poor people. They, do not, they cannot offer the mineral product. Oh, they are the refugee. They are the migrant people. They are the homeless people. See? So we need to be honest. I, I encourage to all my colleagues around the world to be honest with our body, not with the money or, or the country or color what we have. Let's, let's be honest with our body and, and let's have a dialogue on it. This is how, if we keep talking, people don't like it. We are the disruptors. I always said, Mili, into myself, and I hope you all are the disruptors like us. That is why you join. You have many options to join the, um, the CSW session, but you choose the dignified menstruation because you also have somewhere the, uh, the, the same feeling of the disruptors. So let's, let's continue the disrupting this, the uh, global norms uh, around menstruation and make it uh, a just for society. Perfect. And I was just going to read um, in our last, I think, about 10 minutes. Let's see. Should we do one more question? Or some comments, perhaps? Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Doreen says, I was wondering if the blood did not flow from a vagina, so would it make a difference? God made a mistake. <laughs> I think that... I agree. I mean, I'm sure if the blood was flowing from somewhere else, if I cut my hand right now, it would not be as dirty as as you know, as the blood that comes from my vagina. But you know, I, I don't know if it was a mistake. I think that this, the construction of the social construction of menstrual discrimination, that is the true mistake, honestly. Um, we have folks here saying, excellent presentation. How do you make women listen? Thank you for such a bright and informative um, presentation from Simran. There was a big puzzle missing on last days of events without talking about such important aspect of women's rights. Wow, Simi, that's uh, that's really interesting. So, did you did you join the rest of the programs? Did you feel as though that they were that they did not talk about menstruation or or like you know just about the menstruation? Would love to know. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Please go I ahead. Joined many, yeah, I joined many events, but I think because as a child, I've grown in a religious family and I was studying with my two brothers at another city because we are living in rural area at my high school. And I just uh, had to keep silent, not talking to my brothers about my situation when I was <laughs> at my monthly period, you know. Mm -hmm. And I felt such a pressure because I had to cook for them. I had to study and, you know, and at night I woke up late at night crying, just keeping my pain for myself. And it was such a pressure and it had such a big uh, effect on my studies. And um, after, I mean, my bachelor and my getting my master degree, I felt why I should keep silent, uh, why I should not talk to even my family members about my such situation and give them, uh, I mean, better interaction, better understanding. They could even help me in this uh, situation. And I started to talk to my brothers um, and I said, I need help. And I rested at, I mean, that period and but still, when I go to the society, as I told you, I mean, on the chat, uh, I was uh, teaching at university. And during this period, I was not as effective as before. And I could not talk to my students because they were mainly boys. Mm. And in Iran, such a talk is just banned. You could not go freely talk about it. And I deeply wanted to say I could not be as effective. And I need, I mean, your compassion today. And we could uh, go uh, slowly today, I mean, or um, uh, studies and or, um, uh, uh, yeah, teaching. But yeah, <laughs> it's uh, a big gap uh, in Iran, uh, unfortunately, because of this religious pressure and control. And yeah, uh, there is a big uh, <laughs> need <laughs> in Iran. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, that's it's that that, it, it, that is difficult and that is a difficult journey that you're on especially and that we are all on and then and I want you to know that there's support and you you know finding these programs speaking out you're already doing that part and if you and so you know please connect with us further and we'd love to, to support you and thank you for for your input as well uh Radha mute Thank okay, you, really. thank you, thank you. So okay. much. Um, uh, I'm worried about the time. Um, uh, I like to request each of you to visit the, our website, dignifiedministration.org. Though it is not much updated, we have been doing so many things, but we are not updating well. And second thing, we also um, having a fortnight the webinar through the global uh, through the Facebook page of Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation. We also encourage to follow. And if any of you individually or organizationally or any academia, university or any any kind of institution like to get a membership, you are most welcome. It is a, a free of cost. And if any of you like to um, work as a country coordinator uh, from your country, uh, please uh, uh, let's have a separate conversation. Uh, into Mili, myself uh, are open to discuss about it. And if there are the possibilities uh, to learn, to share, and to uh, amplify the campaign, uh, we are ready to do it. We, please feel free to um, the, uh, contact us. And this is the first time uh, second time in 2017, 2017, uh, we also talk about, um, spoke about the uh, menstruation issue, dignified menstruation issue in CSW, CSW, I think 61. And now we have a big uh, discussion. Hopefully, we will um, um, uh, uh, speak from New York in one day, and the all UN leaders will recognize the um, essence of dignity of menstruation. 
dignified menstruation. We have already uh, started the petition to the um, general uh, CEDA, chair of the CEDA committee. If you like to sign it, please feel free to sign it because uh, the menstrual discrimination discussed under the traditional harmful practices, which is not fair because globally the menstruation is a common and we cannot consider it as a traditional harmful practices. That is why we, we ask, uh, we appeal to the CEDA committee chair to uh, reduce uh, this tag. And we also write the um, petition to the general secretary about this issue to, to, to discuss independently, mineral dignity, to discuss mineral dignity independently. So if we together, we can make it happen. One day UN will, will, will put itself as, as a um, dignified menstruation. This is how we are working. And we, Mili, into myself, uh, humbly request you to um, stay touch and write back to us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Um, Radha, mute. I, I saw the I saw the message from a friend from uh, Korea, Chari Lin, <laughs> and we are happy. We are happy to um, have a discussion. Um, we also read um, few um, restrictions in Korea as well. Go in Korea, in Japan, in Cambodia, Philippines, in Asia Pacific countries. Because uh, here, if you go through this book, it is available in online. Uh, we, we have a um, restriction from Asia Pacific, from South Asia, from Latin America, from North America, everywhere. And during the menopause, during the puberty, during the feasting, um, uh, 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 and anywhere there is a restriction everywhere, anytime, everywhere. So please feel free to write us. Yes, thank you so much. And there's a lot of information in the chat box about our email and our Facebook page, our Instagram page and our website. So there's multiple ways for you to contact us and stay in touch. And so we can fight this, this, this fight towards dignity and towards autonomy, liberation. Thank you. I saw the Anupa. Do you like oh, yeah. to say something? Anupa? She's our she's our in our Nepal team, the founding team. We'd love to hear from her. She is there and she's disappeared. Oh no. Maybe okay. some internet issues. Okay. Well, um, we have about three minutes left, so we'll go ahead and let everybody go. Thank you so much. This was so great. Um, namaste and goodbye. Good night. Good morning, wherever you are in whatever corner of the globe. And this will be recorded and it will be put up on our Facebook page. So thank you so much.